several announcements before we get started. First of all, um, the final exam is actually next week uh, on Friday. It is December 7th from 12.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. and it will be held in here. It will not be comprehensive. It will simply cover the material since the last midterm, so the scripting languages portion of the course. There may be some questions on databases on it, but only in relationship to what we've discussed since the midterm and essentially what we'll be discussing today and on uh, uh, Tuesday, plus what we did with PHP with the uh, connection to SQL. So it's just in what you need to know with um, the database stuff is just how it interacts with the different scripting languages. And the exam is going to be multiple choice, uh, short answer, um, uh, multiple answer. There's not going to be any programming problems on it. At this point, you're doing it in your homework assignments, and all I could really do is baby programs that really don't test your knowledge of it. So uh, I don't have, I, I do have a sample final. Uh, I'm not sure if I put it up yet or not. Let's see. The issue with that sample final is that it is, I changed the course. And it, we've covered more HTML and cascading style sheets. Uh, that wasn't covered before. Uh, used to cover Perl. Don't cover it now. So the final exam, the sample final exam, uh, definitely go over it. But like when it says in Perl, why should you use my rather than local? Don't worry about the Perl problems. Uh, just worry about the JavaScript and the PHP problems. Don't worry about the B tree problem at the end. Uh, don't worry about the Perl programming problems. So it's it'll give you a good idea of what to expect. Um, as I said, there'll be stuff with HTML and cascading style sheets and um, stuff with Node.js, which we'll be going over today and on Tuesday. So there's definitely some stuff that you need to be prepared for that I don't have any kind of sample exam for. Questions about the final? Yes? Nope, there will not be. It's basically what you have covered since the, since what we've covered since the end of the last uh, um, uh, midterm and I think the lecture notes are pretty well organized. So you the quizzes that you've sometimes done, the participation activities, those are good things to look at because those are the things that I'll be um, uh, doing. But I know I did a review session for the first one. I'm not going to do a review session well, I don't have time to do a review session for the second one. And also, it, you should be able to put together a set of notes for it at this point, I think. Other questions? OK. Second thing, if you did not see it, I have created a Canvas link for Tennessee Voice. So if you fill out your evaluations and upload either a PDF or JPEG or PNG image uh, to that Canvas link, you can get an extra 30 points on your homework assignments. So it's uh, the homework assignments, you can get over 100% for the uh, semester. So it's an easy way to get 30 extra points you have until next Wednesday to do it. Please don't send it to me. Please upload it on the Canvas link. Makes it easy for me to go through and assign the points. Uh, so. The, I guess those are the announcements. Then what we're covering today and on uh, Tuesday is a technology called Node.js, which is the server-side JavaScript uh, um, libraries that essentially allow you to program an entire web app using JavaScript, so both the client-side and the server-side. 
Today, I'm going to go over kind of the big overview because the book doesn't do a good job of it. The book really just goes through um, some sample fragments and it's hard, I think, to see the overall big picture from it. And part of the reason is there's just so much there, it's hard to present in a small uh, amount of space. So I'm going to try to give you the big picture, show you how everything they're talking about in the Node.js chapter fits together. I'm even hopefully going to have some time to talk about the um, non-SQL database stuff, the Mongo database, even though you're not required to read about it until Tuesday. And on Tuesday, you're going to be doing a tutorial where you will be, it takes about an hour, and it has you do a development of a simple website on your local machine for using Node.js and using a Mongo database, which is a NoSQL database. So there's not enough time to give you a homework problem on it. I think that's the best way to do it, is just devote a class period to having you do the tutorial so at least you get some experience with using Node.js, with using Express, with using Pug, which are the uh, different libraries that have been talked about in uh, Chapter 11. So that's where we're going the next couple of days. So the when we're talking, so first of all, Node.js is not, uh, I'll give you my first quick impression of it, I think it is a lot harder to use than PHP especially at the native interface level. It is a library of functions that allow you to write a server-side application. It is not nearly as seamless as PHP is. And so uh, frameworks have developed like Express to hide all the ugliness of Node.js. So, you are going to see a little bit of the low-level Node.js, but even I, who like to say like with HTML, you need to know the basic stuff, even if you use a framework in the real world. Even I had to throw up my hands eventually with Node.js. It's just so primitive at its um, lowest native levels that it's, in my opinion, almost unusable unless you have a lot of experience with it. Um, I, I, and honestly, if I could uh, code in PHP on the back end and JavaScript on the front end, I think that's a better way to go. But there are some definite reasons why you would want to use Node.js over PHP. That's one of the big takeaways from today. So you may or may not have heard of something called single page application. I know that you, if you completed the first problem in the homework assignment, that you have written a single page application because that deal or no deal problem that you wrote for the um, homework eight was a single page application. A single page application is one where there's essentially a single web page for the entire website. And all that happens is changes are made to that web page. A good example of something that feels like a uh, single page application is Gmail. Great. This is not what I want. Uh, there we go. So come on. There we go. So essentially, when you're working with Gmail, you're just working with a one screen, one page. And when you do things like, let's say, uh, MoviePass. Oh, MoviePass. I loved MoviePass till they essentially made it impossible to use. But you'll notice that when you click, essentially what happens is it's simply replacing this page with that page. So it feels like a single page app. I don't think actually, I'm not sure that Gmail is actually implemented as a single page app, but 
That's the feeling of it. Whereas with PHP, you're moving from one page to another page to another page. You're moving through a succession of pages. Node.js is good in working with so-called single page applications. The idea is that you load everything. Uh, that would include HTML, that would include CSS files, that would include um, images uh, when starting the app. And thereafter, JavaScript modifies And now we'll ask you the question, what does it modify in order to change the appearance of the page? Because I could ask this question on an exam. The DOM. Very good. Modifies the DOM. And typically it uses AJAX calls. to get info from the server. So the general appearance of it is you have here the single page application on the client. You have AJAX calls to the server. You have node.js running on the server. Of course you could have PHP running on it too, but they were kind of single page apps do well. The node.js goes out to the database and then it sends back uh, replies with info. And again it typically would be replying with a JSON object just like PHP would. So essentially Node.js is also just an elaborate scheme to um, access a database, create dynamic web pages, uh, and send information back to the browser. So just like PHP, the big tasks are DB interaction, and dynamic web page creation. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a single page app. It could be just like PHP wanting to create dynamic web pages. So the way Node.js works is first of all Node.js is single threaded. So I'll say node.js versus PHP. So node.js is single threaded, whereas PHP is multi threaded. So with PHP, you never really worry about what PHP script is running. You can have multiple PHP scripts running at the same time. You come into the server, multiple uh, people may be hitting the server, each of them may be executing a different PHP script. The server magically handles it for you. You don't have to do it. In contrast, Node.js is command line oriented. You actually enter the uh, name of your program on the command line. So this is command line oriented. That's not the case with PHP. So I have an example. Probably the easiest way is to show you a simple example. Okay, so here is a very simple node.js program. You'll notice dot is called myfirst.js. And big thing with node.js is it has tons of packages or libraries, more than any other 
scripting language. It just makes use of a whole slew of libraries. So here, the require HTTP is going to essentially set up what is necessary for what is called the event loop. So essentially, node.js is running an event loop. It's just listening for different events that are coming in, and it's going to respond to those events. So this require HTTP is essentially doing what is required to set up the event loop. And it creates an object. You normally assign that object to a variable with the same name as the package. Hence, HTTP equals require HTTP var URL equals require URL. Remember, require is a lot like the include statement in C++. And the URL, this is what the parser for a URL. Remember that the way you, just like with PHP, the way you invoke a node.js script is with a URL. And it includes something called a root, R-O-U-T-E, not R-O-O-T. Again, we'll get to that, which is essentially the command you want executed. It's essentially the event. And then any parameters associated with the event. So this URL library will parse the URL into its component name value pairs plus the um, name of the so-called root. So then you see we create our server. This creates the server that we're going to be listening to. And with the server, you create a callback function that gets called whenever an event that you're listening for happens. So in this case, the function is taking a request object. That's what's coming in from the uh, browser. So this is from the browser. From browser. This is the request, so request from browser. This is the response to the browser. So you have two objects pre-created for you, just JavaScript objects. Okay, so hash tables essentially. And they have various methods associated with them. So the result object has methods for creating a web page. So generally, the first one here is the status code. That is, remember, 200. Just like then, let me get through this, okay? And then I'll. So it's a status code, and it's 200 is what you want, it means it succeeded. Something like 404 would indicate you did not succeed, and the reason why. Then this is saying that the content that we're sending back should be interpreted as HTML. So we wrote the head. Then we are getting the, um, using the URL, we're parsing the URL that was sent in the request object. And that returns in the query variable, it returns the so-called root. Okay, so this is the root. So a root would be something like if the server is, say, gmail.com, uh, absolutely. The only one I can use is red. So that, that works better, I take it, right? Yep. If you're colorblind, I apologize. That's why I try to avoid red. But it's the only one that really, wow, it doesn't pop as much as it does on my computer. OK. Um, so gmail.com, if you then had something like open, Open is what is returned by this query. So that's the so-called root. Okay, And then you would have, these are your name value pairs. So then you might have, um, sorry, year equals, wait. I always get this wrong. Is it a question mark or is it a colon? I think that it's actually a, eh. let me quickly look. It is a colon. 
Nope. It is. I had it right. So year equals, uh, say, 2017. And month equals January. So each name will be parsed into a variable in that query object. And that we can then, so what we're doing is creating our text string that we're going to send back. We dump this, this one dumps the foo object at the uh, command line so we'll be able to see on the console what was returned from the parse method. And then I'm actually going to add the query object as well in a moment. Then this rest.write writes the um, URL back to the HTML page and then rest.end indicates that we're ending or finishing up, so send the page to the uh, browser with any remaining text, which in this case was created up here. And then we are listening on port 8080. So whenever you launch a request, it comes in on a certain port. Now normally that's hidden from you. You don't have to worry for example, where PHP is listening. But here you do. You have to explicitly say what port. That's why I'm saying it's a lot lower level than PHP, not as seamless. You have to know what the port number is. For those of you who aren't familiar with ports, who isn't familiar with ports? Okay, great. Well, okay, don't worry. So when you're coming into, when you're communicating over the internet with a machine, the machine, you have to have a way, like when you say SSH or SCP, that has to have a way of establishing a connection with the machine. The machine uses what are called ports to do that, okay? I'm not actually familiar with the network implementation of them. I just know that you advertise different ports for different services. So FTP may have a different port than SCP. SSH may have a different port. So there's different ports that different services are listening to on the machine. So here we're saying that our service for this web page is listening on this port 8080. Okay? And certain port numbers are reserved, and you can't use them. I think below 8000, you're not supposed to use those port numbers because generally the operating system reserves them for various services. So above 8000, you can choose any port you want. Okay? It's just an arbitrary number. So now, if I, you'll see in a moment how I specify that port in a request, but any time a request now comes in on 8080, that will generate a request object. Uh, Node.js will create that request object, will call this callback function, so this is called a callback function, and this function will execute. It needs to execute very quickly because while it executes the server is not listening. It's frozen, in effect. So you don't want to be putting a huge game, for example, in here, because no one else would be able to access your server during the time this callback function is running. And the reason no one else can is because it is single-threaded. Okay, so there's no, it's not forking a thread. It's running on the server thread. That's why it has to be fast. Okay, so to get this to run, I would now run this, just like Ben, what's your question? Oh, okay, you wanted me to. Okay, on that one you can be more aggressive. Tell me, please use a better ink color, okay, because that, that deals with the presentation. So never hesitate to just even shout out, give me a different ink color. Okay, whoops, don't want to capture it. Okay, so now let's actually run this puppy. And the way we do it, in this case, I'm just run, going to run it locally. Okay, and you'll see localhost colon 8080. So I specify the host and then the port number with a colon between it. 
and now it's expecting for there to be parameters. So the actual name, this is the route name, summer, then question mark year is 2017 and month equals July. I will run it and nothing will happen. Unable to connect. Firefox can't establish a connection to the server at localhost 8080. I didn't actually execute the program. How do I execute the program? By calling it at the command line. Okay, so now it is listening. I, I Node is the interpreter for node.js, so it's a command line interpreter. So now I'm running it, and now I can. It's listening. It's sitting there. Notice it's just sitting there. So now if I enter it, it printed some information. No, it's hard to see. Summer year equals 2017 and month equals July. 2017 July. If we go back to my little program, let's take a look. You'll see that I wrote out the request.url, so that's what this is. This was the request URL. And then I created this text spring with the year and the month and wrote it out at the end. So that's what came out at the end. And you'll notice that I put uh, paragraph tags here. That's why I get spacing. Okay. You'll also notice that it printed some information here. So, whoops. Node myfirst.js, we have this URL and this URL. Okay, and that's because I dumped to the console log what was created by Foo. And you're like, well, how come there's two URLs? Well, apparently two commands have been issued here. You can see one of them had nothing in it. The other one had what I created. So this query had the, the query object had the parameters, the name value pairs. This path name is your route. Okay, the path name is the route that I've been talking about. This was the so-called search string that was parsed by URL into this query object. Uh, the rest of the things you don't really have to worry about at this point. Okay, so I could do another one. We'll say now uh, winter year equals 2016 January. Okay, so it prints it out. And you'll see that down here we produced another couple Uh, requests. Okay, so that's essentially how it's working. If you could get access to my machine, you too could be accessing it and doing it. If you try, however, since this is just running locally, the rest of you can't get access to it. So normally, of course, when it's running on a server, you wouldn't have to type in the port name. That would automatically um, be translate, you just type in the URL for the server and then it would automatically figure out which port to connect to. Okay, so while you're running it, essentially, now I know I could run it in the background, but normally that's not what's done. Normally you're simply running this command, you're running a server, and it's just sitting there in that event loop and it is getting information responding to requests. Now you may say, well, wait a minute, Brad. You said you have to respond very quickly to these requests, but clearly if you're having to go out and access a database, that takes time. So while it's out there at the database, is the server frozen? The answer is no. The reason it's not frozen is because the database code is multi-threaded. <coughs> So the database code is actually, while it's going out there, these callback functions, I have to admit, I'm a little hazy on exactly 
how this is going on under the covers, but in some sense it's coming in, it's somehow executing the function, but that function when it calls a database command, it is put off to the side and the server is still able to get other requests coming in. So in some ways it is being treated as a callback function. The function's being called, somehow it's off doing its thing and the server goes back to listening. And how that's done I'm not exactly sure, um, but it doesn't really matter, okay? It works. Or Bentley, were you going to tell me or? No, no okay. <laughs> okay. So you don't have to worry, the database is off doing its thing and then it's back to listening. So the question is, okay, so let me summarize because we've covered a fair amount here. So it's single threaded, it's command line oriented, it's essentially running an event loop where it's simply listening for requests to come in. So it's listening for requests, just in an endless loop listening for requests. Okay, and then you have a request object, you have a uh, response object, you get stuff from the request object parameters, you fill in the response object, you send it back, and um, the browser does whatever it does with it. Okay, so essentially you use callback functions that take a request object and a response object as parameters. So, roughly how many requests can you probably service at one time and still seem to be roughly um, responsive, that is that you're not actually unresponsive. And in general, they should be able to handle about 10,000 requests, or should be able to handle roughly 10,000 connections, one server. Okay. And of course, that's today's servers. We're not talking about some wussy uh, notebook or something. We're talking about a pretty uh, good server with some good compute speed. Should be able to handle about 10,000 uh, connections a, uh, at a time. And the reason is that generally you're not these aren't hitting you all at the same time. So usually there would be far fewer connections actually active, sending a request. So maybe only 10 requests a second. Because even if I'm connected to Gmail, I'm not hitting the Gmail server every second. I'm reading my email, I'm composing a response. That response as I compose it is being handled locally. It's not being sent, every keystroke is not being sent to the server. So there may be only actually 10 active requests a second. So while there may be 10,000 connections, there's maybe only 10,000 requests a second. That can be handled pretty reasonably. Okay? That corresponds, if you multiply that out by um, 20, 3,600. 60 minutes in a, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, you come up, this is about 864,000 requests. Okay, if your database server is getting this many requests or your website is getting this many requests, you are a very successful business. Okay. So obviously there's a few servers out there, Facebook, Amazon, Gmail, they're getting far more than this, so they're using some, they're 
essentially having to uh, route requests to different servers. But a single server for most single page applications is going to be more than enough. Okay, Because most of the time you're just going out to the database, getting some information, sending it back via AJAX. Okay, so what is some additional information? So we have event listening for the loop. We use the callback functions. Okay, still working with node.js here. So um, the so we're using middleware like like URL is used to parse request information such as name value pairs. into a readable form. Okay, the requested action comes in the form of a path or root. So I'm going to call it a path, but for whatever reason, they use the word root, drives me up the wall, because it's a path. Anyone who's familiar with Unix would call what comes in a path name, but they call it a root name. So anytime you see root name, just think path name, and you'll be good. Okay, and then you write an event loop, so essentially the event loop is essentially a massive if-then-else statement statement that is checking which type of action. You could use a switch statement too. Checking which action is requested. So essentially, you would get use URL to parse the path name, and then you would check what the path name is and take the appropriate action based on whatever that path name is. The path name is like a call to a PHP script. So when I say the requested action comes in the form of the path, okay, that is like the name of a PHP script. So instead of, like in your forms, instead of specifying action equals foo.php in a form, you might have form, you might say action equals um, uh, handle pizza. So using node.js, that's what it would look like. Okay, and then you would have middleware. URL actually does not parse form data. There's another um, middleware package that uh, handles the uh, um, form data. But that's basically what's happening. So a request comes in. You're listening for it in an event loop. You use a middleware like URL to parse it. Then you do an if-then-else on the uh, path name. Based on that, you make some calls to the database. You also get your information from the appropriate uh, form data, make your calls to the database, package it up, return it back. Okay. Unfortunately, once it gets beyond these name value pairs and it gets into things like form data, native JavaScript just breaks down. So first of all, PHP, 
Form data just magically appears in a dollar sign underscore post or dollar sign underscore get table. That doesn't happen in native um, node.js. What happens in native node.js is, first of all, packets are coming in. And those packets don't necessarily contain, one packet doesn't necessarily contain all the form data. So the form data, first of all, may be split over multiple packets. So just because the request object, the callback function got called and the request object is there, doesn't mean the form data is there. If you're use, using native node.js, the first thing you have to do is combine packets to get um, uninterpreted form data. So you don't even have the form data when you have the packets. You've just got to munch them together. So there's some listening that's required. Then there is a middleware package called, I think it's query response. Is that correct? PPT. Uh, yeah, query string. Use query string module. So just like there's a URL module, there's a U query string module to parse the form data into name value pairs. But does query string actually produce nice name value pairs? No. It creates all sorts of cruft at the beginning. So if you have something like a widget that says input name equals, uh, shall we say, age, what you might actually get back from query string is something that looks like JSON, then some header stuff, and finally age. This isn't what you want. You want age. So now you have to do further processing on your own use JavaScript regular expressions to eliminate um, prefix material. This is the prefix material. Okay, it just creates an enormous pain in the neck. You're operating at a super low level here. PHP has done all of this for you. It has sat there and gathered up all the packets into the form data. It has then parsed the form data into name value pairs and put them into a table. If you're using native node.js, you do this yourself. Okay? This is why pretty much no one uses native node.js. It's pretty much unusable unless you are very... Um, accomplished with doing it. So that's why most people use a toolkit like Express, which is what we'll be using in this course. Okay, so this sufficed this little example that I showed you with no dot. And by the way, control C gets you out of it. No big uh, surprise there. So that's all very nice. But no one ever writes this kind of program because it's a nice little native program. It produces a nice little hello world web page. But if you want to do anything useful, you won't be at the bare metal. Okay? But before we go on, so going back, we were saying node.js versus PHP. The question is, both of them have their advantages and disadvantages. From an ease of programmer use, PHP wins. Okay, But there's other things. So Node.js is good for I.O. bound. Or more efficient. When I say good, more efficient. Oh, 
okay, uh, websites. So these are that primarily um, retrieving information. So for example, Gmail. PHP is more efficient for compute bound or computationally intensive. like game websites, games, animations, so I'll say visualization, animation. Anything that requires a bunch of computation, then you should be using PHP. The reason is PHP is multi-threaded. So you can have multiple threads executing simultaneously sharing the CPU resource. Node.js is not like that. If you start in the event loop doing an intense computation, that's it. You've, you've frozen out. There's starvation for every other um, browser trying to access your server. So you use Node.js when you expect to be I.O. bound. You use PHP, at least for efficiency, when you have a lot of computation going on. So for example, Code Assessor, which many of you had the pleasure of using when you were in the lower level classes, has to use PHP because I'm compiling C++ programs and executing them. I have to be able to run multiple student requests simultaneously. So I cannot implement Code Assessor using Node.js unless I just want to piss off uh, the CS102 and 140 students because only one of them can access the server effectively at a time. Okay, now there may be other reasons. It's not like PHP is that much slower than Node.js, but it is. I mean, it's not going to be able to handle as many connections at the same time because it's multi threaded. Multi threaded is higher overhead, single threaded is less overhead. Okay, so. Node.js, more efficient for I.O. bound websites, good for single page apps, SPAs. Questions about that? Or questions kind of about how Node.js works at the native level with an event loop being single threaded, having a callback function with two objects, Okay, using a path name rather than a script name. So instead of calling foo.php, instead our forms use a so-called path name like this, which is called a route in Node.js. And you use a lot of middleware. Middleware is software that takes a request, parses it into so that what you get is um, kind of easily readable, like name value pairs. With PHP, you don't explicitly invoke the middleware. It's just there, it automatically runs for you. Not so with Node.js, you have to explicitly import the middleware with these require statements, which is again, why you don't do it natively. When you use a framework like Express, it does all these kind of stuff like importing middleware for you. Okay, so let's then talk just a little bit about Express and Pug. And you'll be writing, so on Tuesday you're actually going to be using Express and MongoDB to create a very simple uh, website. Okay, so we already got started with it, so let's move on to Express. Okay, so first of all, when you're using Node.js, the first thing you'll have to do, and you'll do this next Tuesday, is you'll have to install or download the Node package and install it on your computer. You'll do that with the MongoDB database software too. So 
MongoDB has a site, Node.js has a site, you install it on your computer and then you can run it with the Node as you saw me do it. I just ran Node and actually here it's just a command line interpreter. I could actually say var equals 10. It's actually a way of running a JavaScript command line interpreter, which is kind of neat. Okay, so you're going to have to download that software. When you download it, you get a package manager called npm for node.jm package manager. And npm is how you're able to then start downloading these libraries like URL, HTTP, uh, query string. So npm is essentially a package manager downloads these packages off the internet, knows where to go out and get them, automatically installs them in local or global directories on your computer. Okay, you can read about that. I think it's in section 11.2. I'm not going to go into that, but with the installation of node.js, you get the npm command, which allows you to install these modules. So normally, you would have this project, okay? And you have directories, so node modules is where you have all the modules that you're downloading. So you create a typically node modules directory, and then npm will store all the modules that you download. So express is one of those modules you can download. npm will put them in the node underscore modules directory. Then you have a public directory, which is where you have the uh, pages that you want to be able to serve to the user. Then package.json is a um, dependency uh, thing. It's kind of, but not exactly like makefile. It's a way of specifying all the dependencies in your project, like all the uh, modules that you're using. Sometimes modules get updates. So when the modules get updated, you'd like those modules to be downloaded onto your computer and kept up to date. So essentially, it is a way of keeping track of all your project dependencies. And then you obviously have your scripts that run. This would be, in this case, your top level script. Okay. So Express does, if you look, so if here you can see that with Express, you again require Express, you get the object, then you actually execute Express to get a object, and from that app object you can now, notice here you just say app.listen3000, and it's a lot easier. You're not running the event loop. So Express is hiding the event loop. So it just has methods here, use. It's saying, OK, serve. This is our public library where our web pages are. So serve things from this library. Use also is a way to say how to import middleware. So the use command is how you are able to use middleware in Express. OK, so then instead of writing in Express, instead of writing lots of a big if-then-else statement, instead you just call either the get or post commands for the method that is being, how the data is being sent, and then you give the path name and then you give your callback function with request and result objects. Okay, So it's a lot simpler because you're not having to set up this big event loop. You simply call the get and post methods. These are like if you're used to Java registering event listeners. Essentially, you're just registering event listeners. So there's get event listeners, there's post event listeners. Okay, and your so-called events are your path names. Okay, so event loop, essentially the events are your path names, your routes. Okay, so Express is hiding that event loop for you. It's just saying, okay, we have an event loop hidden from you. Register 
these um, events with us, and then when the URL comes in, we will call the appropriate callback function. Now, you do not get your, so if you call get, the form data comes in the query object. So in Express, form data transmitted via get is accessed through the query object. request objects query object. So the middleware that Express uses will parse the form data. It will put it into the query object. So query is like query is equal to underscore get in PHP. Same name value pairs. If you are using post, it's a little different. Okay? For post, remember with PHP you had to put in that little line with the content header, how it, um, I said you have to follow this exactly, and you sent something in the AJAX request, and it had something like URL encoded, blah, blah, blah. It's the same thing. With post, stuff is coming in encoded, and so you need a middleware function that's able to parse it. And in Express is something called the body parser will be able to parse form data sent using post. So if you send something using post, then the way you're going to get at it is through the body object right there. So if form data sent using post is accessed via a request objects body object. So the body object is equivalent to dollar sign underscore post in PHP. And you'll notice that before you called it, you need this statement. So app.use, so again, use importing middleware. In this case, I'm importing the body parser. So first I installed it using npm. Then in my program, I um, import it using body parser dot URL encoded to indicate that if it comes in in a encoded format, it should invoke the body parser. And at that point, you will have your um, argument, your name value pairs in the body object. Okay, so that is how you essentially do things with Express. There's some things here like these um, route parameters. I'm not going to worry about them. The route parameters would be well, the route parameters would probably be coming in with AJAX, and we just don't have enough time in this course to talk about how Node.js works with AJAX. But AJAX isn't sending form data, okay? So AJAX could send it via a query string. It can also send things in via root parameters. I'm not going to hold you responsible for root parameters, but you had to cover it in the participation activities for today. It's another way that AJAX can transmit information. Okay, so next time, just so you know, this tutorial using Express Application Generator is what we're going to be doing next time. Which finally brings us to Pug. So, Sometimes you want to be able to generate dynamic web pages. Wait a minute, that's what PHP does so well. 
Node.js doesn't do it so easily. Okay, it's a pain in the neck. So what do we do? We again generate a library, this one called Pug. So Pug is essentially trying to do what PHP does, which is allow you to generate dynamic web pages. Okay, so that's all Pug is. Pug is an attempt to mimic PHP just less elegantly. Okay, so Express works with different dynamic uh, web page generators. So Pug equals PHP for generating dynamic web pages. So Express works with different web page generators. We're going to be using Pug. So it renders, basically you put your templates, so you have a set of templates which each template can be rendered into an HTML page given an appropriate set of information. So think of a template like a function that takes parameters. When you render the template, you're essentially passing it a bunch of parameters. Those parameters are used to instantiate the template. The template becomes an HTML page. That HTML page is sent to the browser. Okay, so in Express, you tell it where to find the view, so there's a views directory. That contains the pug templates. So the pug templates are contained in this views directory. And then you also tell it, because there can be different template engines, which view engine you're using. So in this case, you would say app.set, the view engine to be pug, to indicate that you're using the pug template engine. So then Pug has these very simple ways. I hate Pug, okay? I'm sorry. I can't, can't hide it. So basically they decided it was too complicated to have to put less than and greater than signs for your markup. So instead, you can just use indentation to show you just put a markup thing and then you put what you want. But then if you want something inside of it, like if I want it to have hello pug boldface pug, then I have to remember to do indentation. So I'd have to say h1 hello and then under it, I would have to go boldface pug. Now, I know that's less work. So that's saying that pug is now embedded in that H1 header. It just makes it so hard to read. It just frustrates the living heck out of me. But it is what it is. I mean, many people like this, so that's fine. I just think it's so hard to read. So indentation is everything. So when two things are indented at the same level, it simply means they are outside of each other. Whereas if I indent, then, so here I indent it span, that means the span is actually placed inside of the paragraph. So indentation is everything, it's like Python. It's funny, I don't mind the indentation in Python, I think that's great, but here I hate it. So call me a hypocrite, whatever, but that's how Pug works, okay? So that's the static part. You have your markup text, you indent when you want things embedded within those tags, but you also can render dynamic stuff in Pug. It has its own language for either, including JavaScript. So if you want to put JavaScript, remember in PHP it was a less than question mark PHP, so you created code islands. In Pug, you introduce JavaScript with a dash. So a dash at the beginning of the line says, this isn't static HTML, this is JavaScript, executable JavaScript. So here we're setting the home teams to be an array of Broncos, Nuggets, and Rockies, so I'm guessing this person lives in Denver. And then down here, we're executing JavaScript that 
goes through that list. And then pug has this special form, li equals. So just like PHP, you could say, I think it was greater than question mark in the name of the um, it was something like this. I forget exactly, but you could embed a variable reference. Pug has that same notion of embedding a JavaScript variable reference. You just say the tag equals, and whatever follows it is assumed to be a JavaScript variable name, and it interpolates whatever was in that JavaScript variable in there. So you get this result that you see over here. Okay. And then Pug also has its own, in addition to JavaScript, you can write JavaScript, but wait, you could learn Pug. Why use JavaScript when you could use Pug instead? So Pug has its own language. So he, this is setting a JavaScript variable. Now Pug, this isn't JavaScript code, this if else, this is Pug's language. So I know I'm ranting, but I'm on a roll. The whole reason you're using Node.js is so you don't have to learn another programming language like PHP. So then Pug comes in and says, hey, I got a great idea. Why don't you learn my programming language? Instead of using JavaScript, which is the whole point of using Node.js, why don't you learn my programming language? Okay. So Pug introduces its own programming language that you can use rather than JavaScript. You are totally not responsible for this on the exam. Don't bother. Do the participation exercises, because I want you to at least see what Pug's programming language looks like, and then forget about it. <laughs> OK? As far as I'm concerned, the point of using Node.js is you know JavaScript well, therefore you would like to continue to use JavaScript everywhere. And even if you know Pug well, maybe you could show some mercy on the person who maintains your code who may not know Pug. Like, there's only half a dozen other template engines, and guess what? They each think their language is the best one. So it, it's, it's just like, just stick to JavaScript. If you're going to use Node.js, stick to JavaScript. Okay. So what I want you to know about Pug. Pug is the way you generate dynamic web pages. Just like PHP, it has a way to create static HTML. It has a way to create JavaScript code islands. It has a way to interpolate JavaScript variables into the HTML. That's what I want you to know. Okay, so on an exam, yes. If you see, um, if I ask you how you put JavaScript into a pug template, I want you to tell me it is a dash bar answer. Okay, it'll be a multiple choice. You just recognize it. Yes, Bentley. Is the unless just not good? This is, let's see, unless, I think it's if not. I think yeah. unless yeah. Is, is the equivalent of if not. Yes. Why? <laughs> As I said, well, thank you for continuing my rant. I could continue oh, on with yeah. my rant of why. OK. OK. So that's what you need to know about Pug. Tuesday, look at the um, database. So Tuesday, your reading will get you up to speed with the MySQL way of getting or nodes JS's way of communicating with MySQL. It will also talk about MongoDB, which is a NoSQL database. So take a look at that, and then be prepared on uh, Tuesday to come to class and do the tutorial in class, and I'll be walking around and helping you with that in class on Tuesday. So see you all Tuesday. <laughs>